it's just lovely that we have these public freedoms to do this kind of thing. As you will have noticed, I have disagreed with him profoundly over many issues. I get the impression from his introductory speech that he believes that I, uh, that he thinks that I believe in a kind of god of the gaps in scientific terms, a placeholder. I do not. I believe in the god who grounds the whole endeavor of science. And it seemed to me that he constantly makes the mistake that Richard Dawkins and others make of confusing agency with mechanism. So that believing that God is ultimately responsible stops science. That's absurd. The rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries came about in a Christian framework. And those early scientists didn't say when they discovered, say, the law of gravity, we've got a mechanism, we don't need God. They worship God more because of the genius of the mechanism. I see God not in the bits of the universe I don't understand, but in the bits that I do. The question was raised about the old chestnut that I used to get a lot in Russia, but I now get it in Britain from Richard Dawkins. You know, this infinite regress business, if you say God created the universe, who created God, and so on. But that works both ways. Richard Dawkins believes the universe created him. So, <laughs> so quite legitimately we can apply this question to him, can't we? If he insists on asking who created God, I can ask him who created the universe, but he won't allow me to ask that question. So he's inconsistent. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, and more importantly, if you ask the question who created God, it shows you believe in a created God. None of us believes in a created God. That is a real delusion. And I suggested to Richard rather naughtily that if he'd written a book called The Created God's Delusion, he wouldn't have made very much money. <laughs> Um, so it seems to me that it's very important that we sort some of these things out. And the basic issue, and it's an important one, in this question, who created God, is this. The buck will stop somewhere on both sides. You either stop with matter and energy, which has been capable through unguided processes of producing a universe of producing life, of producing rationality, and of producing the idea of God, because there isn't a God. Or else you believe, I'm not quite finished. <laughs> I see a row of skeptics in front of me. I'm not quite finished. Or you believe that matter and energy are not primary at all, they're derivative. And we start with, in the beginning, God. I want my final point. Have I got a moment? For you certainly have. Point? How much time have I left? Uh, you've got another minute and 40 seconds. Oh, that's very generous. Make that 42. <laughs> we have been faced with someone talking who is a distinguished skeptic. As I understand it, the word skeptine is a Greek word that means to check from a distance. And skepticism is very important, and Michael has demonstrated in many of his books the pseudosciences that we need to get out of our thinking. But ladies and gentlemen, we may start with a skeptical approach to Christianity. That would be wise, to check it all out from a distance. But there comes a point when you have to give up your distance. You see, if I had been skeptical about my wife all her life, she'd never have become my wife. I did check her out at a distance to start with. <laughs> but then, in order to make that profound commitment that has now lasted 40 years, I gave up my distance and approached a person. And belief in God, ladies and gentlemen, is not belief in a theory, because you can keep approaching theories from a distance. Belief in God is in the end commitment to a person, and you can never know the reality of that kind of commitment unless you give up your skepticism and on the basis of the evidence you've accumulated, you start to commit yourself to a person. You won't know everything, but I have tried to argue that there's enough basis in science, in history, in philosophy, in God's self-revelation to be at least 
a platform from which we can begin to give up our scepticism and enjoy a positive relationship with the God that had created us to enjoy himself eternally. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. But also because he is actually celebrating his 40th wedding anniversary. That's got to be worth a round of applause. <laughs> We will conclude with a five-minute rebuttal from Michael Shermer. Thank you, Row 2. <laughs> <laughs> and again, thank you to the Australian government for bringing me here uh, from uh, California for uh, National Science Week, and uh, it's been a great trip. I've still got one more leg to uh, Darwin. So, I guess we've talked a lot about atheism tonight, and I started off by making a comment about um, uh, labels and definitions. I guess uh, one label I saw that maybe best sums up what I think is a bumper sticker that said, militant agnostic, I don't know, and you don't either. <laughs> And I think we've dealt, obviously, with a lot of huge, heavy questions here tonight that uh, I don't know, and John doesn't either. None of us know. I mean, why, why is there evil and suffering, and what was there before the Big Bang, and things like this. It's okay in science to just say, I don't know. In fact, that's one of the sort of joys and beauties of science is that, you know, we don't know, but maybe we'll find out. Maybe you get to figure it out. Maybe I can figure it out. We'll all work on it on this journey together. Um, and so I think I'd like to just wrap up by, by reading a few uh, paragraphs from my book, Why Darwin Matters, on um, what the scientific worldview tells us and, uh, and, and where you can get a spiritual sense of transcendence from it, um, from this materialistic scientific worldview. Does a scientific explanation for the world diminish its spiritual beauty? I think not. Science and spirituality are complementary not conflicting, additive, not detractive. Anything that generates a sense of awe may be a source of spirituality. Science does this in spades. I'm deeply moved, for example, when I observe through my eight-inch telescope in my backyard in Pasadena, in LA, you can still see stuff. The fuzzy little patch of light that is the Andromeda galaxy. It's not just because it's lovely, although it is, but because I understand that the photons of light landing on my retina left Andromeda 2.9 million years ago when our ancestors were tiny brain hominids roaming the plains of Africa. So what science tells us is that we are but one among hundreds of millions of species that evolved over the course of three and a half billion years on one tiny planet among many orbiting an ordinary star itself one of possibly billions of other solar systems in an ordinary galaxy that contains hundreds of billions of stars, itself located in a cluster of galaxies not so different from the millions of other galaxy clusters themselves whirling away from one another in an accelerating, expanding cosmic bubble universe that very possibly is only one among a near infinite number of bubble universes. Is it really possible that this entire cosmological multiverse was designed and exists for one tiny subgroup of a single species on one planet in a lone galaxy in that solitary bubble universe? It seems unlikely. Herein lies the spiritual side of science, the sensuality, if you'll pardon an awkward neologism, but one that echoes the sensuality of discovery. If religion and spirituality are supposed to generate awe and humility in the face of the Creator, what could be more awesome and humbling than the deep space discovered by Hubble and the cosmologists and the deep time discovered by Darwin and the evolutionists? Darwin matters because evolution matters, and evolution matters because science matters, and science matters because it is the preeminent story of our age, an epic saga about who we are where we came from, and where we're going. Thank you.